Hello and welcome to the Kill Gem Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Coddy, and joining me once again, you can't be kept away, Tim Bloomer, my fourth favourite area sales manager for Kill Gem. And he's joining us again once again to talk about a tale from the unexpected. Tim has got 24 years in the industry, and over that time, he's really developed a passion for the insect control side of the business. Tim, how are you? I'm very good, good Luke. And I'm sure I've gone up in your estimation since the last one. At one spot. <laughs> well, one at a time. <laughs> So, Tim, last time you talked about technical knowledge that it was needed to do the job on the ground properly and especially how the importance of insect identification. What insect are we talking about this week? Well, this week, Luke, we're going to talk about the biscuit beetle, um, Stegobium panaceum. And you know, there's a bit of a tale behind this um, intertwined with the technical knowledge. And this tale really does illustrate the need to identify the insect and also to read all the clues that any particular situation can present in order to help solve the problem. So why don't we talk a little bit about the insect identification itself then? What characteristics do we have about this, uh, the biscuit beetle? Well, it really does take an entomologist to sort of, again, identify insects exactly. And we, as we said before, we always recommend that people send their insects in for identification because we're talking minute detail and especially with something like biscuit beetle where it is uh, very often confused with the common furniture beetle they look very very similar to the naked eye and it can be very difficult to tell them apart but of course identification is the key because those two insects have very different breeding sites um, so biscuit beetle breeding in food products and clearly the common furniture beetle breeding in timber and so if you get the identification wrong, then clearly you're going to start looking in the wrong place to start with. So you mentioned two types of insect there, then the biscuit beetle and the common furniture beetle. How exactly do you tell the two apart? Well, it really does take an entomologist to tell the difference. Um, there's a couple of clues that you can use in the field, but you're going to need a really good quality uh, magnifying glass or microscope to, to get to that absolute detail. Uh, both insects are similar size and colour. They're a ready brown adult insect. But the only real difference you can use in the field is the relative position of the head in relation to the thorax when you look at it from side on. So both have the head tucked under the thorax, but it's more pronounced uh, and more tucked under with the woodworm beetle. But You've really got to have an experienced eye, Luke, uh, to tell the difference. And like I say, even if you think you've identified it correctly, it's always best to get that sample sent in. But equally, there are other clues around in that situation that you're in that may help. So, for example, where have you found them? So if you found the beetle in a food cupboard and you suspect it's biscuit beetle, then a food cupboard would lead you towards the biscuit beetle. If it's in a loft, obviously with all the exposed timbers, then that would take you probably down the route of thinking that it is woodworm beetle. And especially if you can find the exit holes in timber, and they would be caused by adult beetles exiting after pupation. But again, you've got to treat that sort of evidence with a word of caution because, you know, you get bird nesting material in lofts and that could lead to biscuit beetle as well. So really need to get them identified correctly and accurately. So what are the idiosyncrasies of the beetle then, like the key identifying features? Or the biscuit beetle? Well, firstly, as in line with all beetles, they display complete metamorphosis of four very distinct and clear life stages, egg, uh, larvae, pupa, adult. And the larvae and the adult beetle are obviously very, very different. Um, the adult beetle itself, when we're talking about biscuit beetle, we're talking a small beetle, two to three mil in length, uh, oval in shape, and this reddish-brown colour. And if you look under a microscope, you will be able to see uh, that they are covered with quite dense uh, yellow, yellowish hairs. Um, the larvae of the biscuit beetle, well, they're five mil in length when fully grown. And they are relatively fat if you compare them to other insect larvae. And when they're in their food source, they tend to also have this, or lie in this half moon shape. They're quite a sluggish larvae and they actually become very immobile towards the end of their growth. Um, so during the first instar stage, the larvae are quite mobile. They need to move into that breeding site and access food packaging uh, and things like that where they will contaminate the foodstuffs. Um, but once they've got that food source located, they develop within the food source. 
they go through four more instar stages before pupating. And then once they pupate, the adults emerge. And those adults will actually wander quite considerable distances in search of a mate. And this is why they can quickly become widespread across the premises. And all of that is going to take somewhere between 12 to 33 weeks from egg to end of adult life. And, and as all insects, that, that band is very dependent on the temperature, the humidity in the building, and of course, the quality of the food source they're breeding in. So talking about breeding then, in particular, um, what exactly is the breeding site for the biscuit beetle? Well, the biscuit beetle, um, again, are classified as store product insects. And that's because the larval stage uh, live and breed and it's, uh, grow within various types of food commodities that might be stored in small quantities in domestic kitchens or, of course, in very much larger quantities of food within warehouses and food preparation areas, restaurants, etc. So you're looking at um, very common insect in food cupboards in houses, warehouses, food production, bakeries, kitchens, that sort of thing. The breeding site often tends to be hard food materials. So we're looking at things like old dough that the larva can actually tunnel into. And as a result, they will attack a wide range of products. Um, and this includes dried vegetables, spices, chocolate, cereals and cereal-based products. And as we're about to find out in the tale of the unexpected uh, pet foods in terms of dog biscuits, cat biscuits, that sort of thing. Another, another thing to bear in mind as well, Luke, is that a very small amount of material can give rise to quite a ser serious infestation. So, for example, you can have um, small balls of old dough that have fallen behind bakery machinery or into the machinery. Uh, that can be smaller than a golf ball uh, or that sort of size. And that will give rise to dozens and dozens of adult beetles. Um, so I'll leave it to your imagination as to what a 10 kilogram bag of um, dog biscuits can do. So once you've identified the beetle and you've located its breeding site, uh, how would you go about the treatment? How would you start? Well, the first thing you've got to do is to accurately identify that breeding site, that food source, isolate it, remove it and get rid of it and destroy it. Um, that breaks the breeding cycle straight away. So then what you're left with is to deal with just the adult beetles that are remaining. Um, so you can keep throwing chemical at these problems and spray treatment after spray treatment, but unless you do that, removal of the breeding site, you will never solve the problem. Once you've got rid of the breeding site, it's been removed from the building uh, to, for disposal, then you can carry out a residual insecticide spray treatment just to pick off uh, any of the remaining beetles um, in that situation. Um, and if you're in a large scale situation, let's suppose a large food warehouse, then it might be prudent to employ some form of fogging treatment as well, or instead of in order to penetrate that building very much quicker. But of course, with any, any treatment, we're talking about treating an insect that's living in and around human food. Then we have to make sure that we're not contaminating that food with our insecticide of choice. Okay, Tim. Right. I think you've hooked them now. What's the unexpected tale? <laughs> um, but again, then drawing back on some, some a story from my, my life in pest control. Um, and this one really illustrates not just the need for a correct ID and a, a good detailed inspection, but also to think about other clues that may lead you to the, to the right solution. Um, and this is a story from when I was a local operations manager. I've got a technician treating a private house. Uh, and this private house had a you know, decent-sized kitchen and dining room. Um, biscuit beetle getting just about everywhere in large numbers. And after a succession of treatments, this lady did lodge a complaint that it wasn't working. Um, so off we go to have a look at the complaint. And I've got to say at this point, the technician had actually done a pretty good, decent job. Um, yes, there were lots of live biscuit beetle, but on inspection, there were also hundreds of dead ones from those treatments that had been carried out. And the technician had gone as far as taking all of the plinths off the bottom of the kitchen cupboards, treating under there, and being very thorough inspecting for potential food sources. So there was a little bit of a mystery to start with. And so far, you know, this seems quite a good story. But what was the issue, I hear you ask? Well, I guess it's where we get to the unexpected bit and the need to look for other clues, because when treatments fail, 
it's often due to something that's being overlooked. Uh, and very often that one thing is probably staring you in the face or you miss it through lack of experience. And that's when a second pair of eyes can be useful. Um, so a bit more investigation, talking to the lady concerned, having a look around the kitchen. There was only one plinth that was still in place. Um, that was on the front of the dishwasher. Um, equally, I was finding old mouse boxes from a previous treatment. And so a conversation with the lady, we found out that actually she'd had mice in there 12, 18 months earlier. Um, and they'd been treated by another company. And she'd also had a dog. And sadly for her, this dog had passed away a few months before the biscuit beetle appeared. Um, and, but there's, there's three clues there that the dog, the link from biscuit beetle into dog biscuits. Uh, and so we got a screwdriver out and we took the plinth off the front of the dishwasher. And lo and behold, sitting behind that plinth was a sizable uh, pile, store if you like, of dog biscuits. Um, covered in insulation, which is typical field mice activity. Um, and so the conclusion is that the field mice from the previous infestation 12, 18 months ago have been quite happily collecting dog biscuits, storing them in a nice, warm, secure place under the dishwasher, uh, and then um, you know feeding on them as they required. Once the mice had gone um, through the control measures and fast forward 12 months, the biscuit beetle have then found this store of dog biscuits and have decided to use that as their breeding site. Um, and it has to be said that you know, the majority of this biscuit beetle activity was close to the dishwasher. But there's the solution. Find the breeding site, these dog biscuits, remove them, clean them out thoroughly, in the bin with those, um, a further quick residual spray into the cupboards, job done, and the customer was then clearly very happy. So what's the tale of the story then? What's the mantra for the pest control to take away? Well, again, I, th I think it's the, the, the message has to be, Luke, that number one, when you're dealing with this sort of insect and any insect, is identify the insect accurately first. Make sure you, you've got all that technical knowledge uh, to hand or you can, you've got people you can phone to get the technical, technical knowledge so that you can, you can think about the right places to identify the breeding site. And then look at all the clues. Don't just look at the obvious stuff. Think what else could be going on with any situation. Uh, so, for example, you know, linking the mouse activity back to a possible biscuit inf biscuit beetle infestation in the story that I've just told. Yeah, it seems like you fancy yourself a bit of a detective, Tim. Detective Bloom has got a ring to it. You've always got work as a PI if you need it. Yes. Well, all I wanted to do when I left school, Luke, funny enough, was be a policeman. All oh, right. <laughs> Do you, see, do you actually see many parallels between detective work and pest control then? Well, I, th I think, it, it, you know, okay, pests are pests and there are human pests in the world, aren't there? Um, <laughs> so both, both are dealing with some sort of pest. Um, but it is, it, it, it's very much, as I say, a lot of pest control work is very much uh, looking for and identifying the clues and piecing the puzzle together. And when you start to put those pieces in place, then you can build the picture then you start to come up with the, the full and the correct solution for your customer. What I find particularly interesting, not having much experience in pest control coming into industry, is the fact that I used to think it was a practical profession, but it seems as though just as much work needs to go into before you start doing the treatment than the actual treatment itself. Oh, undoubtedly. And, the, and there's several reasons for that. You know, um, Number one, obviously, all of, our, all of our customers want their customers to be happy with the service. But if we, if we take it back to a business point of view, then clearly uh, you know, our customers are wanting to make their business as successful and profitable as pos possible. And if you spend that bit of time doing that detective work, you can also save yourself a lot of cost to your business by not having to do multiple repeat visits, dealing with problems in the first place, cutting down the amount of materials you may, may have to use on a job, those sorts of things. So yeah, it's, it's detection first and practical afterwards. Fantastic. Tim will be joining us again for another Tale Than Expected. Uh, next episode, we're going to feature the Tropical Warehouse Moth. Is that correct? We are indeed, Luke. Yes. I like it. He's playing his cards very close to his chest there. won't go too much away. It's another store product insect, and it's another little example of looking for those odd clues that can be around uh, in, a, in a particular setting. Fantastic. Until next time, Tim. Thanks very much for joining us. Cheers, Luke.
for those of you with basis prompt, to get your CPD points for this episode, the code that you'll need is Sierra Quebec Uniform India Romeo Romeo Echo Lima. Thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.